Thank you. Thank you very much. So I promised myself on the way over here I would try a little bit of French. So je m'appelle beau. There we go. And unfortunately, that is all you get. For those of you that don't know French, that was my name is Beau. <laughs> um, and today I get to talk about a topic that is really exciting for me. And it's uh, about my experiences of trying to work on framework agnostic PHP packages. And I can probably trace this back to my uh, early discovery days of domain-driven design. And uh, like most early people do uh, DDD, uh, they tend to focus on the tactical patterns within DDD, like things like repositories, entities, value objects, the, 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 the low-end stuff that developers can grasp a little better. So I immediately wanted to start making my packages uh, tactically pure. Um, and what that really meant was I didn't want non-domain model stuff in my packages. And it turns out that tactical, pu tactical purity is pretty hard, and especially in PHP. But I thought I could do this. I was excited about it, and I thought, you know what? I know a lot of people have tried to do this and failed, but I'm going to try it anyway and see how far I can get. But reality hit pretty quickly, and I realized that certain things just weren't going to work very well. Uh, if you want to try and do domain-driven design with active record, you're probably going to have a bad time. And Doctrine does a little better job of this, but it also has issues in other ways. Uh, it will start to infect your domain model uh, with some of its ideas and some of its requirements. So I learned a lesson pretty early on that trying to make your packages ORM framework agnostic was really pretty difficult. It was difficult to do right. Um, I, I worked myself into some really big messes by trying to do it. Uh, so I decided that I needed to make some compromises in a few places, and it's been a little better since then. So I still try to do as much as I can to make the, the domain model itself agnostic of the underlying uh, ORM or whatever it is I need to use, but I find that it's easier sometimes to make some compromises because getting it perfect is, is really difficult. It wasn't long after I started doing DDD that I started shopping around for a new framework, as all of the code that I was using uh, was my old, uh, old framework, old PHP 4 days. So I started looking around, and I liked Symfony 2. Uh, but there was one thing I didn't really like about it, and it actually kept me from trying Symfony for about six months, and that was bundles. Um, bundles were my first real experience with modern PHP packages, and I really didn't like them. Um, they were based on conventions, or at least at the time for a newbie when you looked at them. It looked like they were based on conventions. Uh, they looked very complicated. Uh, there were a lot of things that I didn't understand why a bundle needed it. And overall, it made my app feel like it was going to be too much of a Symfony application. And that's because it felt like there was going to be too much noise around my actual classes. The stuff that I was important, or the stuff that was important to me that I was worried about, had a bunch of Symfony stuff all around it, and I really didn't like that. And that's really when I first started hearing people talking about this idea of making framework agnostic packages and figuring out what goes in bundles in framework integration type uh, packages versus what goes in your domain model packages. So I ended up using Silex instead of Symfony. And one of the big reasons I used Silex instead was because its, its concept of bundles uh, was a lot simpler. There were Silex service providers, which their whole job was basically just to wire up Pimple. Uh, the service container that, that Silex used. And I was using Doctrine because I, I decided that Doctrine was going to be fine, but there wasn't a very good Doctrine ORM integration library for Silex. And in fact, if you dig around the Silex documentation, there's a, a line somewhere that says that Silex will never support Doctrine ORM uh, in core, which I thought was really bizarre, but that was, that was just the way it was. So I created my own uh, integration library. And I'd been okay with the fact that I was basically writing my models to be Doctrine models, uh, but I, I still tried to do as much as I could to uh, give myself the illusion that Doctrine wasn't what I was using. And one of the things that I was pretty hardline about was not wanting to use annotations, because annotations mixed throughout the class itself made it very clear that these were Doctrine, uh, doctrine models. So I opted to use the mapping files instead. But most of the Doctrine integration packages that, that were out there for different libraries needed to know the exact path to the mappings. And that was actually a Doctrine requirement, but there was no real easy way for the integration libraries to uh, solve this problem. Uh, the way that Symfony bundles handled this was just by convention. Uh, the Symfony uh, Doctrine bundle was able to determine, based on the, the bundle's name, uh, where the files would be located. And this is one of the big reasons I think it's easier for people to ship Symfony applications as a whole bundle with all of the mappings and all of the, the entities in one place rather than trying to split things up. 
This, even the Symphony Doctrine bundle wouldn't work very well if you had uh, files in another package. So if you wanted to write your domain models in one package like I wanted to do, uh, and then write another bundle package that wired those into Doctrine, it just wasn't easy to do. There were some, some hacky workarounds that I found, but for the most part, it just wasn't supported very well. And I saw this as a huge problem. Uh, this was something that I really wanted to solve. So I started looking around to find a solution, and then I realized that we might actually have a solution already. Uh, if we look at uh, Composer and the way that it uses PSR0, it became easy to uh, decouple your application from knowing where the classes are coming from. That's the whole point of Composer, was to make classes accessible from anywhere, anyhow. The way PSR0 works in Composer is you map a prefix to a directory, and that means anytime the class comes in, uh, the Composer looks to say, do I know where this is? And it knows where it is based on that package's project root, which means if the project is, or if the package is installed in vendor, Composer has a way to say, this is where you can find the class file for this package. So your application no longer has to know where these files live. So I started to wonder, what if we used this idea of the PSR0 mappings and altered the rules just slightly so that we could look for resources rather than classes? So it already worked for classes, as, as, as things always work. I came up with this idea of a class path. I borrowed this from Java and Spring and said, okay, well, what if I use the same directory structure, except it's going to be classes instead? Uh, and then it would know where to look for the classes, or look for these files on disk. And this would work the same way with Composer if it installs it somewhere else. So I thought this would be a really great idea. I wanted to try it out. So I created a, a, a proof of concept application that would let me do this kind of thing. And it worked really well for Silex. With the Silex uh, ORM provider, you could configure a mapping and give it a resources namespace so that if, it gets, if it's asked to persist or find a money deal deal in this example, it would know to look in money deal mappings namespace for it, which it would behind the scenes create a class, uh, a class path string to uh, deal.xml within that namespace. And because it's installed with Composer and Composer knows the maps, I was now able to load this externally uh, provided file quite easily by using both Composer and PSR0. I wanted to try and do the same thing in Doctrine's, uh, uh, Symphony's Doctrine bundle, but it was gonna be a lot of work. I started to look around and I realized I was gonna have to get buy-in from the Doctrine community. And I tried to sell it and not a lot of people bought it at the time. And I ran out of time myself to work on it any further. So it just kind of, kind of went stale for a little while. Until I started talking with Amy Steven. Uh, we were talking about a couple of things. Uh, we had some things that lined up. She was working on her Mohalo framework. And I said, hey, there's this cool, you know, class path lookup thing that you could use. So we talked about it quite a bit. And it started to get pretty exciting. She was interested in it. I was interested in it. And at the same time, PHP Fig was working on PSR4. And PSR4, uh, what it brought over PSR0 was shorter paths. Because apparently that's what a lot of people wanted. Uh, so th the real difference here was the four turns to a zero and everything else stays the same. Where it mattered was on disk now, the prefix was no longer a part of the path name. So this made your path shorter, uh, especially if you are looking in the vendor directory. Now, I actually prefer the one-to-one -one mapping for classes. So I, I'm not a huge fan of PSR4 shortening the classes, but I did see something that was maybe interesting for my other interests. I thought, well, we could just create another map for PSR4 and put it in something like resources. Because I never really liked the idea of having to look in the source directory for these other non-source uh, type files. So I thought PSR4 could actually be a really cool way to do this. Uh, and it will also mean that things would look a little more natural. So you could have your source code in source, you could have resources with a top level file called mappings, and it would be really easy to get those. And again, it would still work with Composer just fine. So I actually proposed this idea to Fig, and I was really excited about it. I clicked send, and nobody wrote anything at all for like a week, maybe two weeks. And I was like, all right, nobody likes this idea. Um, but then Bernard picked it up. Uh, how many people were at Bernard's Pooley workshop today? Any, okay, a couple of people. Um, so he got really excited about the idea, and apparently he had also been thinking about these same sorts of things um, in, in, in Symphony community. And putting these things together, uh, he ended up creating a project called Pooley. And what Pooley does is it allows a package now to export resources that are not class resources. 
uh, in a similar way to what I was trying to do, uh, except now it does it specific to resources. Uh, it's, there were people who uh, didn't like the idea that I was reusing class namespaces for file resolution. So this gets around that by making it a completely separate issue. But this makes it now possible for people to export things that you weren't able to export before very easily, like uh, translations, uh, mapping files for doctrine, uh, templates for you know Twig or Place or whatever you happen to be using. So Pooley, I think, is going to be very important for people uh, as, we, as we start moving more into uh, people wanting to create framework agnostic packages. I'd like to talk about controllers for a minute. Uh, controllers have many names uh, and can mean many things to many people. Uh, if you talk about people like doing ADR, their actions, if you talk about uh, hexagonal architecture, it might be ports and adapters, uh, it fits in there somewhere. Uh, if you're just doing plain old MVC, of course it's the controller and model view controller. Uh, but what I'm talking about when I'm talking about controllers is whatever piece, whatever you happen to name it, that translate the HTTP messages to and from your business logic. And traditionally, these have been things that have been in the glue layers within the integration packages. So Symfony bundles ship with controllers. Uh, Laravel packages ship with controllers. Uh, all of these different bundle mechanisms, all of these different glue frameworks have a way to ship controllers. But some of these frameworks also uh, support controllers as services. Uh, Symfony is one of those. So if you create Symfony controllers as services, you're now able to move those controllers between frameworks. You could write a Symfony uh, uh, controller as a service and use it in Symfony, uh, Symfony full stack as easily as you can use it in Drupal or Laravel or Silex. If we take it a next, the next step, uh, PSR7 controllers, if you write those with service, uh, as a service in mind, uh, you can now move your controller pretty much anywhere. Uh, and in the future, hopefully, you'll be able to move it everywhere. Um, Symfony and uh, Laravel and Drupal all already have the PSR7 bridge in place. So people using Symfony right now or Drupal right now can start using PSR7 controllers as a service, and you can start writing code that can be moved between any framework pretty easily. There's one application that I've seen called Glide. Uh, it's an on-demand image manipulation library. Um, and Glide itself, I would consider to be almost an HTTP application on its own. So it's more than just a controller. It actually offers a bunch of additional functionality. Uh, I've used it. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, but the problem was it is glued to Laravel. I happened to be building a Laravel application at the time, so that was all right. Um, but there really wasn't a good reason why it had to be uh, glued to Laravel. If you looked at the code base, you would see that the only things that it was doing with Laravel was wiring up the container. It wasn't doing a whole lot else. So when Glide started to uh, move in the direction of 1.0, uh, Jonathan Rennick uh, decided to pursue the idea of making it based on PSR7. Uh, I think initially he was thinking, let's go with, uh, leave Laravel and go to Symfony. Um, and that way it would be usable across any Symfony application. But if he took it to the next level, uh, he would be able to make it usable across any application. And after two days of exploring this and looking at this, he realized that this was going to be the future. He knew that his application now wouldn't be tied just to Laravel, it wouldn't be tied just to the Symfony ecosystem. He could now ship Glide 1.0 uh, and have it work with anything. It could work with any of the existing applications or frameworks that use PSR7 Bridge, and it would also work with any of the upcoming PSR7 compatible uh, frameworks like Slim3, uh, Zen Expressive, anything along those lines. It'll all just work. Now anybody can use Glide, which is pretty amazing. If you want to learn more about Glide, uh, Jonathan's giving a talk on it tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, so you can see what this application, uh, this framework agnostic application, is going to look like. Is Glide 3 out, or Glide 1 out now? Not yet? Not officially? Not officially. Uh, he's actually down here, so it's not officially out, but the, there, there, there are releases and it's in progress. People are using 1.0. Yeah. So it, it is actually something there that people can start playing with. So if you want to see what PSR7 applications look like, you can take a look at Glide and learn more about it tomorrow. So one of the things that I've struggled with, with this framework agnostic idea, is the struggling with the purist in me, wanting the, the pure domain model with the pragmatist of actually wanting to ship code. Um, because I've spent a lot of time trying to write framework agnostic code that just you know, got dusty on a shelf that never went anywhere because I never finished it. So there's a lot of things that I try to keep in mind when I look at writing, uh, trying to write uh, framework agnostic code. One of them is with if it's closed source. If it's never going to see the light of day, it's by, by anybody else, it's probably not something that needs to be framework agnostic. Because the chances that some little application that I'm writing just for fun 
needing to change frameworks <laughs> is, is, pretty, is pretty minimal. So if you're experimenting, that's great, but if you're not and you're thinking you're needing to do this just because everyone else is doing it, um, I, I wouldn't say that's probably a good reason to do so. So definitely make sure that you ask yourself, will anyone else reuse this? If not, probably don't do it. And also ask yourself if you're ever actually likely, or any of your users are ever actually likely to change frameworks. Oftentimes they aren't. Uh, people can spend a lot of time using this as a reason to write framework agnostic controllers, for example, but if that controller is never ever really gonna be moved, you, you might be wasting time spending effort making that a possibility. Open source is where this actually might make more of a difference uh, because in the case of open source, you have a lot of potential users, uh, users you don't even know potentially, and they may be using a lot of different frameworks. So where framework agnostic packages is really gonna make the most sense is probably for open source projects. So if there were some tips for writing framework agnostic packages, um, I would say make sure you consider your goals to see if you even need to make it framework agnostic. I think this is really important for people to do, uh, especially people like me who tends to lean in the direction of going this way anyway. Uh, not everything needs to be framework agnostic. A lot of things can be, a lot of things should be, but definitely make sure that you're not gonna be wasting your time, or your client's time, or your company's time. If you haven't done this before, I would suggest starting simple. Uh, one of the first things that I did when I started to experiment with Symfony uh, was to take a bundle and start moving classes outside of the bundle so I could at least make them look like my own. Uh, so that I moved the entities into a namespace that made sense, not just under the, the, the bundle's namespace itself. So definitely start small. You can, you can do these things piece by piece and you can make sure that things aren't breaking as you go as well. Definitely try pulley. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't run into this problem before, you probably don't, don't, don't know you need it. I think that where we need to get uh, the most buy-in is from uh, library vendors. Uh, library vendors like Twig needs to have a pulley loader. Uh, Doctrine needs to buy into it so that we can get Doctrine loading uh, external mappings, translation libraries. So if you manage a library or maintain a library or use a library, uh, these are good candidates for uh, trying to get integrated into pulley. I think the, the, the most important thing for me uh, is if you're writing stuff into a bundle right now, if you're actually contributing code to a bundle that, is, that should be considered like a glue package instead of you know, actually writing your application there, think about that code. Is that code that you're writing, does it, does it rely on the, the framework itself? If it doesn't, those, that's a probably a good indication that that code could probably live elsewhere. You could pull that code out, put it in its own package, and then other people can build a glue package around it for whatever framework they need it in. But if you build this into the, the bundle itself or into the glue package, that code's locked in there. Nobody's gonna be able to get to it anymore. Uh, the best example I have of that is, it, it may have changed now, but it was several years ago, uh, I was looking for a Gravatar package. You know, Gravatar is a pretty, pretty reasonably simple thing, uh, but there was a Symfony bundle for it. And I'm like, great, I'll go look at the Symfony bundle. I wanna see what they're using behind the scenes to uh, integrate with, with Gravatar. But they hadn't done that. They'd actually written a little tiny one file class that did all of the Gravatar integration and put it inside this huge bundle. And I didn't want that. I, I, I was actually using Silex at the time, so I wanted just the Gravatar part, but I couldn't do that without getting everything else within the bundle. So I, I went to Packages. Packages was still pretty new at the time. I'm like, all right, Gravatar, search for Gravatar. Oh, there's a Silex service provider already. So I'm like, cool. Open up the Silex service provider and look to see what the dependencies were. And their dependency was on the Symfony Gravatar bundle I was just looking at. And I looked at the code and it literally just used that one class to provide the service. And by using that, or by requiring that package now, I brought in the Symfony dependency injection component, the configuration component, a bunch of other things, because this Silex service provider required a Symfony, service, or a Symfony bundle that required a bunch of other things that Silex wasn't even using because it wasn't a Symfony application. So, so this is the kind of thing where this person probably just wrote it really quickly. Um, they want, and they just had a few things. They had some like Twig views helpers they wanted in there that were specific to Symfony. It was really easy for them to do it that way. Uh, but I think that's the problem is that things like that can be really easy for us to do. Um, and we don't always think about, you know, what if other people want to use this code? So I think there's a lot of code out there like this. Um, and I just think that as a community, we can look at these places and, and start extracting those bits out into their own packages. 
This was really tough for me, but realizing that uh, it can be difficult, especially at the domain model layer, to uh, keep your domain model from being influenced by your ORM. Uh, it's best if you just accept that and just pick whatever you're using and, and do as much as you can to keep it out, but realize that there's some things that you're just not gonna be able to change. Uh, I solved this problem by writing my own ORM for one of my projects, but that doesn't solve the problem. I'm now tied to my own framework, so I've really lied to myself in that case. Uh, but, but it is best to just realize that sometimes, especially at the, the persistence layers, it can be difficult to uh, chase out all of these sorts of things. Container configuration is hard, uh, and by this I mean uh, if you look at the Symfony uh, Doctrine bundle versus the uh, uh, Silex service provider for Doctrine, you'll see that there's a lot of duplicated code, but it's, it's radically different. Uh, it's because Symfony's dependency injection container is very different than Pimple. Pimple is very simple. Um, so you'll see this a lot, especially with the more complex uh, applications like Doctrine, or complex libraries like Doctrine, that uh, you'll just have a lot of duplicated things. It's doing exactly the same thing, but in slightly different ways, and there's just no way around that. Um, there, there have been a couple of people who have proposed container configuration extensions or container configuration uh, ideas to PHP fig, and each time it just comes back as no, because it's going to be a really hard problem to solve. Maybe it will happen someday, but uh, it's not likely to happen anytime soon. So there is still a need for glue packages, and most of what those glue packages should be doing probably is wiring up the service container for whatever framework you're trying to connect it to. What you could do if you do something with containers is use uh, container interop, uh, but this, is, this should only be done if you absolutely need to have service locator. I'm by no means advocating usage of service locator, uh, but if you do have a service locator or need a service locator for whatever reason, and you understand the, uh, why you're using it, um, I, would, I would suggest taking a look at this project. It's uh, called con container interop, and it's the precursor to PSR 11, uh, which is currently in draft status. So if anyone uh, has, has a need for this, definitely use it. I think there are implementations of container interop for pretty much every container out there that I've ever heard of. So definitely take a look if you haven't looked at it yet. I've tried to, to go to great effort to make actually, uh, to actually make separate packages for the business logic from the glue layers. Uh, so I will actually create a, uh, a twig extension and then I will create the Silex twig provider for that extension and a symphony provider for that extension. Um, I think that this is pretty important for people to do uh, because the uh, alternative to that is what people generally do because it's easier is to only require the, the extension points as a dev dependency and then suggest those dev, uh, suggest those dev dependencies as an actual dependency. And this is pretty weak because this means that you don't take any advantage over what Composer can be doing for you. Uh, for example, if you require a specific version of Symfony and you have your, your package that required dev a certain version of, of Symfony, you can't enforce that requirement on your users anymore. So they could technically use your package with a completely different version of Symfony that isn't supported because you have suggested it as opposed to actually required it. So definitely if you can, uh, create separate packages. And uh, it's not always the most easy thing to do. So what a lot of bigger projects have done is still worked with a big package, with a big repository, um, and then create subsplits or subtree splits of the components. So for example, Symphony Symphony um, and Laravel, uh, I think Illuminate uh, has, has these as well. Laravel framework is actually Illuminate components um, where one big repository has all of the code and there's one master project like Symphony Symphony or Laravel framework that replaces all of the, the subtree splits. Um, so this, this gives you the benefit of being able to do all of the code in one repository. So you can do integration testing, all the testing across the entire code base, but still give people the ability to install parts of your project or parts of your um, application uh, without having to get the whole thing. So you trade the simplicity for being able to work within one, re one repository with the complexity of having to manage and maintain subtree splits, which is, is not an insubstantial thing. Uh, that Unless you're Symfony and can actually afford to write your own solution, uh, you have to use something that I wrote to actually do this, which has bugs in it. And uh, if anyone has, has ever seen Taylor Otwell talking about uh, Illuminate's split process, I think it takes two hours per split now. 
and this is due to bugs in the underlying git subtree command, um, there's just no way around it. So it is something that if you do decide to do this, you have to be aware that you have to build a process around it, which, which can be not a lot of fun. And finally, I'd say experiment. Uh, that's, that's what I did for a very long time. I'm still doing this. Uh, try to push the boundaries of what you can do with your domain model. Uh, try to figure out what sort of cool things you can do to make your code less dependent on the framework that you're using. Uh, gives you an opportunity to potentially get more users from other frameworks. It gives you the opportunity to design things differently. Uh, your design can actually become better if you start uh, relying on your own application instead of uh, letting the framework do everything for you. So definitely experiment, see what you can do with it. And if you want to learn more about Glide, you can see uh, Jonathan's talk tomorrow. Jonathan also has another talk tomorrow, uh, Framework Agnostic for the Win, uh, which will probably be very similar to this one, but cover slightly different ground. Okay, and that's it for now. Uh, I think I probably have some time for some questions, if anyone has questions.